what up everybody and welcome back to another episode of the nerd gen report you know why i like this show brian is because although we have humor in our conversations these are really deep conversations that we have in about the genre and the reason i like having these conversations because it helps us sort of understand what a lot of this stuff means in terms of what the news comes out, what this person says and what the business is doing. You know what I'm saying? So we try to under really understand what the future is going to look like. Um, and I have to say, Brian, when I started hearing the reaction to Shang-Chi, I was always talk. I was just thinking back. And my first thoughts were like all the stuff that I was saying <laughs> before, uh, you know, based on what we were seeing in the trailers. We didn't have a lot of confidence in this movie doing so well, and hearing the 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 reactions and the, and the, the stuff that people are saying about this film made me also think about all the stuff that they showed us is nothing compared to what we're going to see overall. Um, and it's like we were on total opposite ends in terms of what what we were feeling about the movie and, th and it being like one of... And hearing people talk about where this movie, li movie lies within their ranks in terms of the best MCU film and stuff like that. Hearing people uh, sort of give away their list. You heard stuff like Thor Ragnarok as being number one. Um, and none of them seemingly talked about Captain America Winter Soldier. It may be due... Well, perhaps not because they mentioned Thor Ragnarok, but it's incredible how highly they ranked this film. Tell me, Brian, what you felt immediately after reading of some of these comments, some of these reactions. Uh, I was I watched John Campia, and I mean, he's always excited about these films, so it's hard to take his word for it. But most of the stuff that he was saying was being reiterated. In like such a genuine, uh, in, in, with such genuine emotion about how good this movie is, man, the excitement level that I had in the beginning, before the trailers, has returned. What are your thoughts? Honestly, I was a little confused. Um, confused about what? Because. I can't think of another movie in this genre where the trailers went this way and then the movie was light years better than that. I know. I try to I know. think back and say, okay, was there, there definitely have been movies where an initial teaser, actually Batman Begins is a good example. The very mm -hmm. first teaser of that, which really doesn't show you anything except a very end Christian Bale's face and they digitally impose the cow. Coming off of Batman and Robin, where we were with Batman at that point in time, I found that underwhelming. And the movie's obviously very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't, but that's a teaser. That's 60 seconds. I, I couldn't think of where well, we've gotten these multiple full trailers, we've gotten featurettes, we've gotten TV spots, and they're throwing all this at you. And quite honestly, to our prior discussions, it looks you know, entertaining, but it doesn't look necessarily spectacular, spectacular like next level special. Mm -hmm. Doesn't line up with this. So it just got me scratching my head a little bit as to what's going on here. Like if, if the reactions are legit and that's the level we're going to operate on and the stuff they that's being legit. thrown about, it's, it's the range, right? So we're seeing some people really respond to the emotion, the story, which that part I probably would have the, the acting because of Tony Leung I would have said okay that's probably the easiest yeah. and like Aquafina is always entertaining and Simu Liu as we said pretty charismatic guy I would have said alright I'll take 
I'll take the over on that. But then there's other people that are really singling out the stuff that you cared about, the martial arts, saying it's the best looking martial arts they've seen in a long... And that was Hollywood Reporter, I think, that said that. It's not a nobody. Yeah, man. And the best martial arts I've seen on screen in a long time. Like, that's a big statement to put in a reaction. That that renews my confidence, though. That's where my confidence comes back But from. that's what Keep confuses going. me, because then I'm like, okay... Hey. Other than the little, other than the sequence with the death dealer on the skyscraper, which I've said that's my favorite sequence, there's nothing else in the trailer that I would put at that level. The fight on the bus looks fun, but I wouldn't say that's like Bruce Lee level martial arts. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little suspect that the final fight could ever really be that because it has to involve the 10 rings. So it kind of has to involve magic and sort of other powers. Mm-hmm. So that's not really going to be pure martial arts anyway, between, uh, between the Mandarin and, and, and Shang-Chi. So then you're kind of left with, does it have to be the, tur- is the tournament a bigger piece of this? And that's what's being hidden where we've been teased abomination versus Wong, but like we haven't really, other than Simu Liu with his shirt off and him doing one sort of handspring, we haven't seen any. Or are there other entire scenes, either from the training um, or elsewhere that they just haven't put on screen yet? But that would be a little bit odd, as I said, given they've shown you so much footage that to show you all that and never tease what in theory, I guess would be the literally the best parts of the movie is unusual from a marketing standpoint. I think these people are just so excited about how, about how good a movie that they have that they really didn't care too much about what they were putting out. I think they were probably over enthusiastic in terms of what they were putting out. And I was just so high on the film that through word of mouth that first weekend that it's going to be or that first weekend or when people first saw it, you know, like with these reactions, the word of mouth is getting out there and it's hard not to, to think that what, and, and some of these guys did a great job of not revealing anything. Although there are some people saying a few things here and there Given with the 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 mid scene credit and the end credit, they say stay for that. I mean, we obviously stay all the time, but they're like stay for it, man. That second one is is crazy. It's gonna oh, you know, is that anticipation plus obviously what people have been saying in terms of how beautiful the movie looks, right? Um, so and and and, and the the chemistry between Agrafina and Simon Liu, so. There's a lot of things to look forward to in this film based on the reactions and based on individuals having sort of similar feelings um, that we have towards the trailer. They weren't impressed. They wasn't, these weren't impressive trailers, right? And so they, before this movie came out, and was uh, seen by the for the people that they invited, they were had the same sort of level of excitement that we had. So for them to do that switch and speak so highly of it brings my excitement back to where it was in the beginning. So, hey, I bought my tickets and was crazy about it. And we'll get into some of... I don't know if you have anything... I was to add to this, uh, Brian, before we move on to sort well, of some numbers and things. So you're all the way back. Yes. You're, 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 where, so how, okay, scale of one to 10, how high did your concern level get? Like what's the highest, most concerned you were? Ooh, like what number? I was at a, I was at a seven. Oh, wow. Okay. So I, I didn't go. So, and now you're at like a one, zero? Yeah. Yeah. I'm at, I'm at like a, I, I'll say one. I'm not going to give it this perfect thing but let's a see one. okay so we went from one to seven to one so i probably went from a one to a five and i'm probably gonna stay at like a three so let me let me okay. i want to get my cold water bucket out for a second here <laughs> okay i'm just gonna put something in the ether so black widow 
80 percent plus fresh on rotten tomatoes i think that is massively overrated i think you would say it's less overrated but i think that's high i think that's mm-hmm. high i think you have an 80 percent type critic score for that movie is high mm-hmm. so i kind of feel like all right that's the first mcu movie in two years maybe they graded on a curve got a little bit suicide squad 92 percent rotten tomatoes i get that it's crit as we talked about why the critics could like it that is also overrated in my opinion, and I think audiences agree with us that it is not a transcendent. Like 92% is on par with Iron Man 1. That's on par with Captain America Winter Soldier. Like that's on par with like Dark Knight. Like, no, nah, that movie's not in that class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it possible that coming off the pandemic layoff that the critics may be overzealous and are their... kind of a little bit over enthusiastic because they've got movies of this type and they're kind of reviewing a little bit colored right now because we they just haven't had these films for a couple years and so everyone's kind of getting the benefit of the doubt just a little bit yeah hey if you haven't eaten in seven days that piece of cracker i tossed you, uh, you're you gonna be like that's <laughs> delicious <laughs> I don't, I, 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 it's possible. It's quite possible. I'm not going to say that is, is impossible, but based on the people that I sort of uh, listen to on a day to day and reactions from other people, um, everybody be, seems to be singing the same song and possibly some remixes that are even better in terms of how, how much they really love this movie. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm back to one in terms of excitement. Okay. But yeah, I understand. I, I mean, look, I mean, I'm going to go see it in the theater. I'm not worried about that. Oh, yeah. um, you, want, you want to talk about that now? Because I, I just, oh, I oh, that, sh- that's been an interesting development yes. in, all, yes. in all this, that Disney stuck with the strategy. I bought my tickets, I think yesterday. After hearing some first reactions, let me buy some tickets. So I bought them sitting in the same seats that I bought uh, for Black Widow, the same exact ones. Yeah. Because they were available. There was a bunch available. Yeah. And I said, let me see what they look like today after all the talk. Still a bunch available. Yeah. But it's going to be interesting to see. I'm going to keep checking from time to time in le- leading up to a Shang-Chi uh, release to see what seats are, seats are available. If they look bad in terms of there's a lot available, then it's hard to say, even with um, the praise that it's getting already, it's still difficult to think that it'll reach 100. Now... No. Oh, there's no in the current climate. Yeah, no yeah. chance. Of yeah. That. Now, what's interesting though about this is that we're not gonna be able to purchase it at home. You have to go to the movie theaters to see this. You have to go to the movie theaters to see what everybody else is talking about within the the the, the subsequent days after people seeing it that week. Is it going to be returned to that? Oh my God, did you see this movie? No, blah, 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 boom. You know, let's see if the second weekend drop off is crazy. We're going to have 45 days. This is, this is what Bob Chapek was thinking about. This is going to be interesting. An interesting experiment. Brian, you know how I feel about this. This was nothing but. You know, misunderstanding and 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 Seema Lou is just too hype right now. <laughs> just too hype. What are, what were your thoughts? I, you know, so I, I sort of was thinking, okay, how do we grade the performance of this movie financially? Because it, it basically has no chance for a fair shake. And what I mean by that is, so you, have, you know, whether it's the U.S. or Europe, you have too many limitations. 
you know, you have, you know, mass mandates coming back, you have seating restrictions that were never went away. I mean, there's some theaters never got above 50% capacity to begin with in major cities. It still hasn't passed censorship in China. So we don't have a Chinese box office release date, which I think would be given that there was backlash to this yeah. uh, along the way, that will be interesting as well. So there's really almost no way to assess the performance of this movie. The only thing I came up with was watch this, watch the audience score because if the audience that does go to this movie rates it an A or an A plus, that would indicate to me that it will do very well in digital format, you know, and I would submit if that's the case that Disney should re-release this movie in the theaters next year. Um, I'm just going to float this idea, this idea that like, if you have a great movie and you literally physically cannot show it to the, to a, to a global audience, the way you want, I say this about tenant too. They yeah. should, although the tenant was more mixed in terms of reception, but if this is, unilaterally loved by audiences and critics you do i think yes. marvel like next christmas like find a slot in the calendar and put this back in the theater yeah. for another 45 days and and i yeah. bet you actually make some bank doing that which would be pretty unusual but i think the word experiment experiment is appropriate for this film because it, it is. that's be, what it is yeah, yeah and he did not mean that with reference to the yeah. cast or the content or the film. It was purely about the format. <laughs> and I mean, Simu Liu got his like Shang-Chi pose out against Shay. I'm like, <laughs> well, easy, yo, settle yo. down, settle down. No need to make a hundred copies of yourself right now. Like settle yeah, down. Yeah, it's all yeah. right. So, so that's the experiment right there. Cause you got thing, you got a number of things to look forward to how well it does in 45 days. Right, because you can still make a hell of a lot of money in forty-five days. The only place you can see it is in the theaters. This is the beginning of that. So this is a, a, a an experiment in, in in that regard. Um, there was an article I sent you, Brian, um, and it's from Variety. From Black, and it's, the title is called "From Black Widow to Shang Chi: Superhero Cinema Confronts an Uncertain Box Office Future," and this with respects to what we're uh, referring to in terms of the forty-five days. Um, whether or not Shang-Chi is going to make a decent amount of money over that weekend. Um, but he spoke to the all, overall superhero genre, and there was something I highlighted here that made me think, and it is not, not to throw any shade at DC and Suicide Squad, but it was interesting to interpret what he said. He said, and I quote, you don't go from 133 million to 26 million. There's other factors that played in the pandemic. He's basically, to me, saying, well, we it said. ain't the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. it ain't the pandemic. And he's, he's, yeah, he's basically reiterating what we said uh, about this last week. It's, it's, this is not the pandemic. He points to, tit he points to tit title confusion, the film's R rating and explicit violence. I think uh, the explicit violence had a lot to do with this, and especially a cast lacking any A list DC characters. I just think we come to the sat to a point of saturation where audiences are sort of tired of these superheroes films, especially if they're superheroes that they've never heard of. We said all this. And he says something regarding, we've had this conversation about saturation and fatigue. When I refer to fatigue, I mean, hopefully we don't uh, come up uh, upon a day where we don't want to watch a Marvel film <laughs> or a DC film, right? Um, but it's these obscure characters that Nobody really cares. Like, imagine the boys would have came out in the theaters. How do you do that movie without us not, without us, with, with us not liking that film the way, you know what I'm saying? You got to look at Suicide Squad done in the series, then that makes, you get to introduce and slowly build something. The boys is successful because of that. And it's super violent. 
right? And, and invincible, super violent. But we, we love the show. Suicide Squad in a movie, all these characters. Sure, some of them were cool and stuff like that. And you had a good time. But I can't see this two hours of it. So I think it's exactly what we said, though. It's like <laughs> it is exactly what we said, because, again, it's not just that they're ca- like, I actually don't totally agree with the characters you've never heard of. I don't mm-hmm. totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. The problem is actually the opposite. People had heard of these characters because they made the movie five years ago. True. He compared That's actually them. part of the problem. Yeah. I, I yeah don't yeah, tell yeah. me it's not. Like people sat here confused. And then not only that, I almost feel like the confusion was compounded by the fact that they had some repeats and some newcomers, which I don't blame who they brought back. Except for maybe Jai Courtney. Way to get a check and get blown up in five minutes. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But, you know, like Waller, Kinnaman, Margot Robbie. No complaints about bringing those characters back. But I do think it added a little bit of confusion for people to see. Like, wait, why are we seeing this character again in another movie with who now? And, like, it's just too close. Like, you think about re- like remakes are inevitable. And there's so many sacred movies that are going to get remade that shouldn't get remade. But you know what? They don't make them five years after. Like, be like, nobody came in 1980. <laughs> no studios walking around saying, hey, you know what? Let's remake Jaws right now. Nobody's saying that. <laughs> nobody's saying that. They 50 waited years 20 years. Now, yeah, yeah. 50 years from now. Yeah, they <laughs> might do that. Five years. As I said, the characters that are durable, Batman, Spider-Man. Those are the characters where, as we saw, I'll give you another example. Amazing Spider-Man 2, 2014 movie, did meh, okay, not great. Spider-Man Homecoming, three years later, following Tom Holland's introduction in Civil War, does a billion dollars. Nobody had a problem three years later seeing a new and improved Spider-Man on screen because it's Spider-Man and it's done well. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, I, I understand people love the Suicide Squad and all that. Um, but you hit on a key point with the boys. The art today on the studio side is as much about anticipating where a property is going to find its audience. You yeah. have to get that right. That's part yeah. of the equation. Yeah. And like choosing TV over a movie, choosing um r-rated tv maybe over network tv those are critical decisions to make money on these properties like suicide squad maybe it'll have maybe this suicide squad will have a second life you know in in in, you know video or future like maybe all of a sudden people will come back around to it over time there are other ways to make money on a thing but as we said there's no franchise here for the immediate future. There is yeah. no friend. You can't use these numbers in any way to say like, great, let's spend $200 million budgeting for suicide Two, suicide squad Two. Yeah. And, and, and we're sorry from taking it from a high note to this note, but this is mostly talking about the future of the superhero genre on, um, in theaters and on the small screen. Um, rather in, either in series or, or, or in movies, but you know, like you said, you got to know where this is going to find that audience that's going to enjoy this. And so I, I, mean, I have a quick question for you. Yeah, if Disney Plus was you know 112 million subscribers strong in 2015, do you think Ant Man is a theatrical movie? Or a Disney Plus series. Disney Plus, man. In my right. opinion, but right, they made money. But I'm saying, but, but you got Kang the Conqueror coming. But that feeds my point. Okay. Is Marvel recognized that with the playing field where it is now, for Ant Man to continue as a franchise film, the stakes had to be raised. So they put their big bad in that franchise. They didn't put Kang in, I mean, they would never do this, but in Spider-Man. Spider-Man didn't need it. Put it in Ant-Man. I don't think that's a coincidence. So this is a lot of fortune telling on their end. 
or, or predicting and just sort of they're strategizing in that, you know, we're going to do Ant-Man Quantum Menace and Kang is going to, we knew Kang was going to be in, in this film. And after seeing, and probably after seeing what Jonathan Majors did, they can't wait for this movie to come out. So, yo, know, Marvel is a beast, man. Marvel is a beast. And speaking of that, well, let's, before we get into uh, uh, that topic, um, and this is regarding um, uh, Brad Winderbaum yeah. um, overseeing Disney Plus shows, I want to really quickly talk about Venom since yeah. we're talking about movies and, and the theater experience, whatever, that's getting delayed to October. Apparently, it's getting, it might get delayed again. Do I you think, think it will? It, you think it will? Okay. I don't, I don't understand. You know, when I first saw the rumors of the delay because the trailer left off a specific release date, I was like, okay, they're probably onto something. And Sony, you know, Sony. This is all they have for superhero franchise, right? It's sort of sp the Spider-Man universe is what they have. So they can't afford for these to to really to bomb, bomb on them. Yeah. And you know, Venom 1, very successful at the box office. It was 800 million global box, even for mixed reviews and kind of a little bit of a strange movie, quite honestly. But but yeah. uh, but it, it really did well. People liked mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't surprised at the delay. I was surprised at the three weeks. I don't really understand, quite honestly, with the climate that's out there in terms of, you know, COVID and people's concerns, what that three weeks is going to accomplish. Yeah. Other than from a marketing standpoint, you don't have to totally remarket this film. But yeah. I would probably venture to say this gets pushed back. I'm going to float this out there because I think these are linked. You know, all eyes on No Way Home, right? The absence of a trailer, yeah, the absence of any discussion. That, yeah. I think there's a real chance Venom actually takes the Spider-Man slot at Christmas and Spider-Man backs up into 2022. That strikes me as a, a way that, because Sony's already basically marked the date. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a way to preserve their calendar. And I, I just I think at this point, it seems almost inevitable. They need those two movies to be full power. And it's the reason why we perhaps haven't gotten a trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. Everybody's been asking. It's asking 90 plus percent of why. Yeah, everybody's been just waiting for that. Um, and fortunately for us, tomorrow we're going to supposedly going to see, well, by the time you see this, it's going to be done already. But Eternals is coming out with a trailer. I was going to say something about... Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you took it uh, that idea from my head. Um, yeah, No Way Home could possibly be delayed as well. And and that's a good option for them if they wanted to go that route. That makes a lot of sense. So we'll my see. only question there would uh, be how connected is Benedict Cumberbatch's role in that movie to Doc Strange 2? Does the order matter? Because I don't think Marvel's moving off their weekend in was it March of 2022. So does No Way Home kind of need to come out before that, or does it not matter? That, that I'm curious about. I, I I think because of what's going on with, you know, I mean, and, and again, we have to have our conversation regarding Spider-Man, so I don't want to give too much away from that conversation. But because of what happens there and what we think, it, this is leading towards you sort of it'll be in, it'll be interesting to see if they do it you know after if they if it really matters but if whatever day they do decide if they let's say delay spider-man and the pandemic is still running rampant god forbid We're gonna see, we're gonna we're gonna see some more delays, right? Um, especially if that is the case that it has to come out before that's just strange too. I think it's a really interesting variable, and and obviously keep in mind that Sony doesn't have a Disney Plus, right? They don't have a dedicated streaming option to add or yeah. change the format. They it's for them. This has to go to the theater. For, the, for this to work. So I'm very curious about that because we know it's a multiversal movie. Whether this one needed to come out before Doc Strange 2. Because like I said, I don't think given Marvel's calendar, I don't think there's any chance right now that they would move off of March 2022 for Doc Strange 2. Yeah. 
Before we move on, <laughs> this that variety <clears throat> article was very interesting. And I am, you know, ask you guys to 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 read it. It'll be in the description below. You know, Disney obviously has their eye on Shang-Chi and well, how it does in the theaters. If this doesn't do better than perhaps even Black Widow or not even out, you know, close to it. Do you think that they rethink the day and date strategy again? So I've thought about this too. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I, I mean, look, at the end of the day, they need to figure out a way to make money off the movie. Um, you, gotta keep, you, gotta keep, you know, I think. Going. So Black Black Widow was 80, 80 something just in the theater in the US. <laughs> I think if Shang Chi, I think if Shang Chi's over 50, it's a win. I, I really do. I, I don't I think the I, I don't I don't think I just think right now people it just seems like people's concern level has gone up meaningfully in the past couple of weeks. So in my mind, I'm kind of like, all right, Suicide Squad with great reviews was at 26, but with an R rating. Black Widow was the high water mark with a day and date release at 80, 50, 55. Sounds like a pretty good number, honestly, with what's going on. I mean, F9 was 70. I don't see it. Like right now, yeah. people were optimistic when F9 came out. Um, True. But, but what I would speculate on is, okay, so you got 45 days. What if Disney introduced a a new tier after 45 days? What if this thing, when it went to Disney Plus, didn't do so for free? What if it yeah. went at ten dollars or fifteen dollars? Like, could they monet? Could they make additional money? It, right about now, I think a lot of people that didn't go that opening weekend would be quite willing to fork over some money at a lower rate, especially to see this movie after 45 days. So I don't know if that's something we see. I mean, as you said, interesting experiment. I mean, it's all on the, it just tells you like, it's all on the table. There's nothing yeah. that's sacred right now. I mean, you saw the thing with the 45 days, I sent this to you, which I thought was interesting was, I mean, I don't even know how firm the 45 days is because Paramount, I mean, Snake Eyes did so terribly in the theaters. Yeah. Paramount was able to get it, uh, it apparently is bringing it to their service inside of 45 days because it's just done so poorly. I guess it's going to be out of the theaters by then, so that allows them to do that, but it made me just wonder yeah. about the contract language about this as to what studios can do. Like Bob Chapek said, it's a very interesting experiment happening with this movie, and I look forward to seeing what happens at the end of these 45 days. Let me ask you one other question before we leave this mm -hmm. point. If if the reactions are correct, mm -hmm. what are the odds you would see it multiple times in the theater? Me, I don't know enough people that like it as much as I do to go a second time. I'd probably, I probably just watch it once and wait. Um, yeah, I would I wouldn't go back. Even even if it's like the I'll wait 45 days. Would you would you would you think differently if there was no pandemic? Oh yeah, if it was if it was okay. yeah, yeah. I would I I would I'm confident that I would say, yeah, I'll probably go see. I wouldn't hesitate. Right now is like I know I probably won't go. Okay. But if it's like yeah, I'll see it again. Definitely. I think like the, obviously the path to 150 million, 200 million, 250 million dollar weekends is you need people to see the movie again yeah, and again. Yeah, right? That's yeah, a big, that's yeah. a big part of this. Yeah. 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 Which makes it interesting. Like, yeah, after the 45 days, do we try to get a little extra after this? I think you try. I think you try, especially if this movie is as good as everybody thinks it is. And I think Marvel content should, especially if you release it in the theaters, should have a little bit of a premium if you want to see it 
right after you know you pay whatever he needs to pay to see the first when it when it releases there right and then it's everybody no, who's put, yeah it's no different than like honestly for years like what they've done on like itunes right it's like the movies yeah. in theaters then it goes to itunes you can buy it for like yeah. 9, 20 or 30 bucks and then you ultimately you can rent it they always yeah. used to have that so yeah i mean i bought batman long halloween one and two there you, you go know? um let us move on from this topic we've talked about it quite enough but i hope you uh get the gist of where we're uh heading towards um based on that conversation please let us know in the comment section below do you agree with a bunch of the stuff that we said because there's a lot of stuff we said there i don't know if you'll catch all of it but let us know in the comment section below brad winderbaum will oversee marvel studios disney plus shows I don't know if we've had this conversation before about, you know, Kevin Feige being the guy in charge and, and you know, definitely we, we we finally understood what the parliament is and some of the people perhaps that are involved in that. You'd have to think that it's quite possible that Kevin Feige is just, you know, like, I feel confident enough in this gentleman who, if you read the article, which is in the description below, he's been there a while and he's he's climbed the ladder and, he, and he's earned his shot. And Kevin is like, this is your shot. Same way Kevin came up, he was a part of some of these uh, X-Men films. And I don't know if any others, there was, there was a couple of them that were bad. Which one do you know <laughs> that he was producing on? Uh, on the X Men side, yeah, did he produce yeah, but, Last Stand? Last Stand. I mean, the, I mean, the, we know what the bad ones are. I mean, it's like Last Stand, and I don't know. I doubt he was involved in like Apocalypse, or he definitely wasn't involved in Dark Phoenix. But, but so it have to be. It would have to be Last Stand because that was yeah. the. Yeah, yeah. Or X, unless he was involved with like X Men Origins Wolverine or something like that. But i think so i think i heard you know i'm gonna look that up but there were a few that he was involved with that weren't that great but uh, i'm pretty sure his hands were tied with certain things of how far he can you know in, have his input in, uh, on the, those films but we're starting to see uh, i guess a trust factor with kevin and other people really taking the reins and um obviously still having that you know final conversation about where this is going and how should it go and all this stuff and you know and you know Marvel keeps on moving on and who knows if he does fantastic quite possible that he may be the guy to take over Kevin Feige and Kevin Feige says I'm done you never know Brian, what, is, what were your thoughts on this when you saw this? Yeah, like, I mean, we, we had a discussion a long time ago, which was the whole thing about Kevin being stretched too thin and what is Marvel and Disney going to do about that as the empire expands, right? And so yes. we're getting our answer, right? There's the parliament that's always existed and now we're seeing the keys to various parts of the kingdom being given to some of the underlings. Mm -hmm. They're obviously going to keep it in-house as much as they can. Uh, yeah. And so you're going to see that ascension, not, to, you know, not the least of which is you know, when I see an announcement like this, part of it also to me is you have to think about the competitive landscape. We've talked about, we know Discovery is, you know, Warner, Warner Discovery is going to be hunting talent in the next six to nine months. Like if this is a guy that might have been on the radar to get picked off. Kevin was like, hey, man, do you want to throw him, you want to throw him <laughs> some bones, right? You want to be like, hey, you know, like you, yep. you're not going anywhere. Yeah. But yep. look, I mean, it's, this is the inevitable challenge. Right. It's there's only one Kevin Feige. Nobody's perfect, but there's only one Kevin Feige. And in the same way that like all these great directors start production companies. Right. So they start to help finance other films and other directors. And it's like, but there's only one Steven Spielberg. Right. It's like he can have him blend entertainment, but there's, there's only one Steven Spielberg. So yeah. it's up to these people to carry on the legacy, try to improve it, add new wrinkles to it. And it's the kind of business where, look, if they are poor imitations of Kevin Feige, the audience will let you know that pretty quick. Yeah. So 
not all of these people are going to succeed, but it is the necessity of broadening a universe is you have to broaden the management and you have yeah. to broaden the operational infrastructure around these yeah. to have any chance because Kevin Feige as great as he is. If you forced him to micromanage every single one of these, it would ultimately dilute the quality because even he can't be everywhere. Yeah. 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 And I think we first started having this conversation when it was announced that he was uh, doing a star Wars film. That's when I think yeah. that's when we first started talking yeah. about it. So uh, and this, this was what last year, maybe this is a lot. Yeah. Stick with us people. We talk about stuff and, and, and we end up here. Right. Um, I feel like Brad Winderbaum though, is the, uh, He's he's like in the office with Kang when that announcement's being made, right? <laughs> and then Kevin's as Kang being like, I knew everything that was gonna happen. Was about, like now it's on you. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. up word. to you. Word, yeah. word, word. I mean, yeah. Just just think about the responsibility Kevin has had for all these years and to, to give a, a a piece of that away. Into yep. you know to someone you trust you know that's a that's a deep conversation. It's especially not especially when these are characters who pass back and forth. Right? Yeah. This is not hey here's your sandbox and here's my no these characters go between small screen and big screen. So you screw one of these up really badly. Yeah, it has ramifications elsewhere. Yeah, but that's why that conversation between Kevin and, and, and himself have to has to happen and, and it will yeah. happen. Next up, Anthony Mackie officially signs on to starring Captain America 4. Now, I don't know if we had um, some announcements almost immediately after the Disney Plus shows that there was a Captain America 4 happening, correct? There was not a confirmation from Disney. Was a, it was reported. It was reported, reported that it was yes. happening with the with the show handlers from Falcon and the Winter Soldier be, being the writers, I believe, for for this new iteration. Why do you think it took so long for this announcement to take place? That Anthony Mackley officially signs on. Do you think there was some negotiation happening in between? that that why, why it took so long for this i mean because you would think that anthony mack we were like oh i'm i'm on i'm in right we've and yet this time frame from its initial report to now seems like a long time what are your thoughts i think i know nothing i think it had to do with two things number one is i think it connects very tangentially to the scarlett johansson lawsuit as we talked about, these are the next generation of contracts. So I think there's some really careful negotiation on the studio side and the actor side to figure out like, okay, if yeah, depending yeah. on how this movie's released, how do I get compensated? Yeah. I think the second piece of this is like I said, because these characters have become fungible between the streaming service and the big screen, I think some of the contract language probably centers on what exactly is he obligated to do here? Is he is he signing up for Captain America movies going forward? Is he, are there options for him to do seasons of Falcon and Winter Soldier or appear in Disney Plus? Like, I think these contracts are more complex than people realize now because this character can move across different types of properties. I just think when you have that at stake, it's going to take some time, even if both sides know that we're going to yeah. get this done. So that, that would be my best guess. Yeah. That sounds about right. Um, next up, Secret Wars. Ah, before we move on to Secret Wars, I'm quite certain that you would agree that um, this Captain America 4 is going to have something to do with Secret Invasion. It's going to be connected to Secret Invasion heavily. Mm -hmm. Right? All right, let's move on. Secret Wars comic writer says Marvel is developing a live action adaptation of that storyline. There's been multiple storylines of Secret Wars, five actually, and I just read that today. 
Um, one of them has close ties with the the multiverse. One, one of them had to do, deal, deal with that. And I think because of what happened with Loki at the end of the Loki, and what we already were thinking about these wars, these multiversal wars. To me, when I heard that and saw that, Secret Wars, right? So I think they're building towards that. Obviously, this is going to be a, you know, a big, huge film. Um, this is no confirmation. This is more rumor, but like a big rumor, correct? Well, the article is very specific about interactions between the writer and representatives from Marvel. They're not exactly all in the most favorable light either, but it yeah. does sort of indicate talks have been had. And, you know, you called this a long time ago and it seemed like we were we would get here in some form. I, I don't know that they're, you know, the talks also seem to indicate they're looking for an adaptation that may be an amalgam of some of the Secret War storylines versus yeah. saying we're going to pick one and that's yeah. going to be the one. So I think, again, Marvel's probably going to play a little bit loose with its own mm -hmm. canon um, to translate from pages to screen. One last question before we move on. Do you think we're going to get some connection to the beyond the in this storyline <laughs> and how they build this because that's a whole nother thing right there it's like well, how do you introduce that guy but go ahead yeah look I, I i certainly think it's possible i you know we didn't have a follow-up to the henry cavill talking with marvel um discussion but i did see one story cross where he was connected to adam warlock and okay. it's just you know, I wasn't saying it to be like, is that a credible rumor or not? But just the idea that there are layers of characters like that, like the Beyonder, where we haven't even explored them. And so we know they're coming and it's just a matter of time and how Marvel wants to seed them. So why not? It's a it's a fun, you know, it is a fun character. It's a different kind of character. So yeah. why not? Why not start to bring it in this way? Quite honestly, Brian, the only person that can play that character, and I think that would be so dope. Give me one name you think I'm thinking. Well, you think I think you already Beyonce. said it on this show. Ooh. Keanu. Yeah. yeah. Keanu Reeves is perfect for the Beyonder if they attempt to go there. He's perfect. I think he would do it. You think, hell's yeah. Why wouldn't he do it? He don't got to do nothing. <laughs> he don't got to do nothing. You know, I don't know. And before we move on, I don't know if you've seen um, some of the, the photo leaks of... Um, the God Butcher. Yes, Christian Bale. Yeah. That looks pretty. It, it looks pretty. It yeah. looks nice. It yeah. looks really nice. It looks fairly recognizable, really elegant. but it looks very yeah. true to the true to the comic. Although I we, we don't want to get down to the Thor or Thor 4 um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. discussion here, but I I will say that. The way Suicide Squad played out from the standpoint of like the way critics lapped it up and then the way we ultimately kind of felt about it. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of that. Oh, yeah, definitely. With, no, a definitely. little bit of that with Thor 4, right? That fear of no, it's going to be goopiness. Same. Yes. Yeah, a little bit of that same thing. Yeah, I'm there with you. But nonetheless, Christian Bale looks pretty good in, in, in his... Uh, makeup and costume or whatever uh let's switch over to some dc news we didn't have a bunch but there are a few that definitely caught my attention when i was sent uh, a few uh, articles about it um first let's talk about this um i want to i want to talk about this because this is this has me hyped because as soon as I read it, I bought the book. I pre-ordered the book. <laughs> so um, let me see. On August 15th, 
Penguin Random House listed the Batman, the deluxe junior novel special edition, The Batman. According to the publisher's description, the novel will be a prequel to Matt Reeves' feature film and will be, will be released February 2022. Now, this article uh, that Brian sent me from Sports Skeeter, um, the article talks more um, about uh, the PG-13 rating that it might get and the reaction that people were having towards that rating. Brian, doesn't change anything. Hmm. It changes nothing. This could have been rated R, rated PG-13, PG, <laughs> I'm there. And obviously we know what it's going to be. PG-13 or rated R is fine with me. I don't care because he pushes the limits, you know, and it's just, it's, it's, it is what it is. And again, I stand firmly at, as this movie, hoping everything is okay. This movie is going to be the best performing movie that year. I think it was always going to be PG-13, and quite honestly, the the line for what PG-13 is now is pretty intense. I mean, you can you can really get a lot on screen, um, where like I, I, that's not a concern. And you know, it, it, if Matt Reeves has an R-rated cut of this, and they want to throw that up on HBO Max afterwards, great. That probably just gives them a little more viewership. But like, I don't think what? the rating makes or breaks that movie. No, how you feel about this movie? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. The world building is interesting, though, right? The novel yes. as a prequel, the Gotham TV series that he's working on. Like, this is a pretty expensive project that he's put together around the character. Brian, I haven't read a book, like sat and read a book for a minute since the, probably since the last book that I read was, I think, The Hunger Games. That was the last book I read. And but I had read, you know, like Batman No Man's Land, Batman Kingdom Come. There were some Marvel joints that I read, like novels and stuff, and I enjoyed them very much. And this one, as soon as I found out about this, is like I gotta buy it. I gotta buy it. And it, it's especially when you know, I, I every time the Godfather comes on, I, I watch it. And I, lately I've been watching these YouTube videos where they sort of break down certain situations because Godfather, if you're watching it for the first time, there's a lot to understand it. Yeah, that's fair. Right? There's a lot of subtle things that people say and all, all that stuff means something. And so when you go, when, when I'm listening to these YouTubers talk about it, they also go back to the books, right? So to give you more context. So... This book, I think, is going to be very important for me anyway, to sort of further immerse myself into that world when when it when that movie comes out. What a what a great tangent. By the way, on the, on the Godfather thing, like I, I'm of the mind that you if you if it's your first go, watch one, watch two, and then watch one again, because the way they set up two was sort of the prequel and the current, it sort of connects you back to the performances in one yeah. and you kind of actually appreciate them more once you see where they go with them and two yeah it's funny you're talking about that this generation it misses out on this the novelization of big of event movies was such a big deal like when we were kids like i don't know yeah. how many of those you had or bought but i remember like for because back then like they would put the storybook out before the movie came out it would be like a little like a month or two before and there would always be like some photos from the film or lines in the storybook that would not make the final cut mm -hmm. like if you read the original star wars storybook which is pretty valuable these days there are scenes in the book which were in the original cut that are not in any of the additions that made it to the final screen you can find the scenes on youtube in the deleted scenes okay but it's just interesting because back then, like you didn't have, you know, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have, you know, sports, you didn't have all these things you could do. So you just read this book and the book would tell you, like, if you really wanted the spoilers, it would kind of tell you like what was going to happen in the movie. But then you watch the movie and realize that it wasn't exactly the same as the book. So it was like your one clue yeah. into how things were, were changing and being edited. So I miss those days. Those things were always really fun. 
Yeah, man. I can't wait to read the book. Um, and I can't wait for that movie, man. That movie, I think, is going to be very, very uh, well received and it's going to be the best thing we've ever seen in, regard, in regards to, to Batman. Michael Keaton being the best. And speaking of that, Michael Keaton didn't understand his Batman return at first. Now, Brian... Michael Keaton looks like a smart guy. The fact that he had to get people to come and explain this to him. And granted, he's not, you know, he doesn't, he's not into the superhero genre film like we are. So he may not understand certain um, things in comic books and references or whatever the case may be. But the fact that he had to reread the script and have, listen, He's going through and people, he's taking time understanding. We get to see this movie the first time and get your reaction, whether we understand what the hell is going on and how I would want to be in that room, him explaining the multiverse to him. Tell me, because I want to know. <laughs> we know about the Marvel Universe and the, and, the, and the multiverse. We know about that. We saw it happen. We understand what's going to be coming within the MCU and how this, this event changes a, a whole bunch of stuff. We understand it. With this, we might see it for the first time. I believe we are gonna see it for the first time and how this multiversal works. And it's not Flash from the movies showing up in the Flash from the show episode. I yeah. can't even that 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 scene is like a minute long. I can't bear to watch it. Well, look, I mean, I made this point during Loki as like people people probably don't appreciate what what they accomplished there with the exposition, right? You, now Loki is actually a great rewatch, but yeah. you don't actually need to because between Kang and Miss Minutes you they explain it. the rules pretty concisely. Those are the cliff notes right there. So when we when we read this the risk is that they put it up on screen and you just go like what? And it, it gets too confusing to where you don't actually want to go back and rewatch it and unpack it. Now we will, because that's what we do. Yeah. But the mass audience, if it, if you throw them for too much of a loop in the outset of the multiverse, and you don't establish, you know, solid boundaries for what you're trying to use the multiverse for, mm -hmm. it can go off the rails really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was interesting. You know, I, Michael Waldron did an interview where he openly said that the Kang scene in the Loki finale was inspired by the architect scene in Matrix Reloaded. But then he okay. added, then he added, and I thought this was classic, at the end of it, he said what he said, he goes, except if it was good. <laughs> That's what he said. And I was like, so he, he oh, got that that was really snap. confusing. Wow. Yeah. Not man. that that was really confusing. And he's like, so we want to do that scene. But we want it to make sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Man, that's gangster right there. For those people who say, oh, I understand the. Part. Yeah, that's you. I mean, Hell Raid, no Scooby Snacks. I don't have any. Great for you, but, you know, I. If my kid doesn't understand the equation, you know, it's like what I have to show him. And that, but we only have this one or two hour movie to, to get what you're trying to tell me. That's it. After we leave that movie, who are you going to talk to? You're going to have to watch this movie again or just watch that scene again and over until you. And it's just too much. It's just too much. So. Whatever. But. I think we know now why it was taking him so long to officially sign on. Remember, he was saying, "Yeah, where was it? Was his schedule and and it was then it was COVID protocols and and it was like, no, 
he didn't understand he didn't what understand he was doing was in the doing, movie. Yeah. And that's what took a while before you said, okay, I'll do it. The Affleck mm-hmm. thing. So, I mean, you've probably seen this, but it does seem like a, a fairly large and growing legion of fans has turned their attention from the store of the Snyderverse to trying to resurrect the Ben Affleck. Like Batman. Batman film. If they do it, hooray for them. I, I don't think they're going to go th- that route. I think they're going to see what happens with the Batman. And after it does gangbusters at the theaters, they're going to be like, nah, we don't need this. We don't need this. We got this monstrosity over here. This is do just fine. Uh, next up, Cobra Kai star Zolo Maridueña has been casted. Um, for Blue Beetle. This is going to be coming out on HBO Max, correct? Yep. This is a perfect example of one of these films. Although, w- could you make a case for Blue Beetle going up on the screens, bro? I can make the case, but I, I think I think this is the safer place for it to start. And I still submit, I still submit if a show in its initial run goes truly viral i don't think it's impossible that you could then make it a movie for the sequel i I don't think that's impossible is this a show or a series i think it's a series isn't it a limited series i i could have i could have sworn was it a movie movie. i think it's oh is it a movie okay i think it's a movie okay well either way i still think if it does big enough business and views you you can then make the sequel on a on a big screen certainly certainly so let's see I think it's a perfect casting. Oh, the, I mean, if, if you've ever seen the Cobra Kai show, the minute you see him in the show, you're immediately trying to figure... I mean, I kind of threw him into the Miles Morales camp, even though he didn't necessarily look as much like the comic character. Mm-hmm. But because of the, the Latin roots, I thought he could he could pull the character off. And as he's aged through the show, yeah. he's actually aged quite well, I think, like as an actor and sort of... I know he had like, spoiler alert, he gets injured in one of the series, yeah. in one of the seasons, but... You know, he 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 has sort of that athleticism, martial arts prowess. Kind of plays like the both the bad boy and the good boy pretty yeah. well in that show. Yeah. So I think he's you know that That's it's some, funny like shows some like some that. It's right like there, yeah. yeah, like you look at shows like that and like you're immediately just combing the ranks of the cast. Like I think I think her name is Peyton List. She plays Tori in that show, kind of the mm-hmm. evil. She, like he could, you needed a young kind of antagonist for a Marvel or DC show, she could easily do it. Like, yeah. it just, you just look at these shows and you're like, these, they're ripe with talent that could move into the genre. Yep. So I'm actually I, really psyched that he got this role because it's kind yeah, of a yeah, big me too. deal, obviously. Yeah, me too. Um, I was first introduced to Blue Beetle in Young Justice. So based off of that, and I love Young Justice. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't know if you guys have seen it. If you haven't, I suggest you do see it. Young Justice cartoon. Um, and when I heard this casting, I was like, this is this is perfect. Um, that was our last topic. We don't have anything else, right, Brian? No, I mean, we got a couple of shows to catch up on and break down. Soon. Yes. Um, we got to watch. Uh, I saw the first What If, but uh, the second one, I haven't I haven't gotten around to I've, it. I've, I've caught. I've, I've, I'm I'm through the first two. Um, I guess at this point you probably should. I mean, well, we'll see how the rest of the series goes. But at this point, you should probably take my show rankings, crumple them up, and burn them. Yeah. I've been upside down <laughs> on this. We got to revisit that. Don't talk about. It. We got to revisit that. We got to revisit that so we can see how badly we did, or how good we did. Um. But yeah, that's our show for today. And we uh, ask that you please hit that like and subscribe button, hit that notification bell, share with your friends. And um, really do appreciate everyone who comes uh, and listens to our show. And um, Brian, any last words, man? I mean, I I, I don't know about you, but that Shang-Chi early reactions and the way people are talking about it, just I just can't stop thinking about it, man. I'm with you. I'll be there open. I'll be there opening weekend um, as well, and and very very excited to uh, very excited to finally see the character on screen. So, yeah, 
and we we gotta do something real quick after at least spend like 10 15 minutes talking about the eternal Strider when it comes out because i have a feeling they're gonna show us something big in this Ooh, okay. literally literally i think they have a feeling they're gonna show something big in this uh and that's our show we'll see you next time